Hello, and welcome to the fourth SSP webinar of 2019. You are joining us for the discussion titled Plan S Opportunities for the Future of Scholarly Publishing. I'm Jeff Lang with the American Chemical Society, the chair of the SSP webinars working group, and we're pleased that you could join us today. In a moment, we'll get started and hear from our moderator and panelists. You'll be seeing the SSP screen as we start this discussion, and your phone will be muted automatically in consideration of our presenters and our following webinar participants. Please use the questions feature on the GoToWebinar to send your questions in, or if you need to let us know that you're having any technical difficulties. The moderator will review questions and present them to the panelists. Please help them by specifying to which presenter you'd like your question directed, and please send your questions in as you go. They will be addressed after the brief presentations. At the conclusion of today's session, you'll receive a webinar evaluation via email. We encourage you to provide feedback so that we can continually improve the SSP webinar program. You'll also receive a link via email to the recorded broadcast of this webinar. Our moderator today is Jason Point, who's an active SSP committee volunteer and an experienced scholarly publishing executive with over 25 years experience, mostly in journals publishing, with Walter Kluwers, Elsevier, and now at the International Anesthesia Research Society. Now I'll turn over the webinar to Jason so that he can introduce the panel and get us started. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, as Jeff said, I'm Jason Point, the Publishing Director at the International Anesthesia Research Society. Uh, the word protagonist was originally used in connection with ancient Greek drama to mean the main character in a play. Reference in the plural eventually became common as well, and from the 19th century, it also took on a secondary definition of supporter of a cause. This sense probably arose by analogy with antagonist, the pro and protagonist be interpreted as in favor of, while in fact, prot here derives from the Greek root meaning first. Open access has been part of scholarly research and publishing for more than 20 years. And while the share of content published under OA licensing has increased rapidly in recent years, its adoption lags significantly behind the goals of research funders and other advocates. This is driven for calls of immediate mandated action to make broader OA compliance a reality. For today's webinar, SSP has assembled a distinguished panel of protagonists in all its senses to discuss open access, open research, and Plan S. Each of our panelists is truly a main character in the real life drama of scholarly research and publishing. And today is an opportunity for them to share and discuss their views of the future. Our first panelist is Dr. John Walensky, Coast the Family Professor of Education at Stanford University and Director of the Public Knowledge Project, which aims to improve the scholarly quality of and access to research and scholarship. John is also a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and author of several books on education technology and open access, including The Access Principle, The Case for Open Access to Research and Scholarship, which won the 2006 Blackwell Scholarship Award. John often works with small publishers and societies to help them transition to an open access publishing model for their books and journals. Our second panelist is Dr. Stephanie DeMent, Director Open Research at John Wiley & Sons, where she has a focus on growing open access and open research within Wiley's extensive journals portfolio. Stephanie spent 15 plus years as a cell biology and immunology researcher and assistant professor before moving into commercial publishing first with Wiley, then Elsevier, Nature Publishing Group, and Biomed Central. Stephanie returned to Wiley to be part of their efforts to adapt and develop open supportive business models. Our third panelist is Dr. Harold Vaughn Varmus, Lewis Thomas University Professor at Weill Cornell Medicine and Senior Associate Member of the New York Genome Center. Harold is also co-recipient of the 1989 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for studies of the genetic basis of cancer. Previously, he was director of the National Cancer Institute for five years, president of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center for 10 years, and director of the National Institutes of Health for six years. Harold has spent the last 20 plus years advocating open research and open access publishing in both his public service and private careers. He is the official US ambassador for Coalition S, the international consortium of funders supporting Plan S. Our webinar format today includes no slides, after making initial statements, our panelists will engage each other in an open discussion and are eager to field questions from you as well. So please submit your questions at any time and I will ask them of the panelists during the discussion period. Now, over to John Walensky. Thank 
mute. Uh, thanks, Jason. So pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm going to start by positioning myself as a researcher involved in scholarly communication. I'm a professor of education, but I'm very interested in public education and the world that research could open uh, in terms of public education. Um, so I want to talk a bit about what I um, see as part of the opportunities that Plan S offers. Uh, my own work has been working with small publishers, small to medium-sized publishers, um, a great deal of concern in the social sciences and humanities, um, given that they haven't been at the forefront of this, which uh, open access has been led by the biomedical field largely. Um, and our response as a project, the public knowledge project in particular, has been around developing open source software, so building platforms. We do see that there are technical issues to the move. Um, and open source, we think, is a very strong way of working in that direction. It's interoperable. Um, it at least starts from a base that's very economical in terms of its distribution. Um, and then the other aspect is to work with publishers directly to see that there are needs for new economic models. And that's partly my interest in Plan S. Um, some people have seen Plan S as being a little dogmatic, a little too uh, focused on the traditional model, traditional open access models of APCs. And, uh, and our approach has been to work with small, medium-sized publishers um, around a different, around a different kind of approach. Um, we'll be talking more about uh, the uh, publish and read model that's uh, uh, some of the publishers are using. What we've been working with is um, a simpler, what we think of as at least a simpler approach, uh, and that is to say that the libraries now endorse, have always endorsed open access and have been willing to support it in various ways. Um, and so our approach has been to come back to them and ask them to subscribe to the idea of open and subscribe to open access conversion, if you like, or transformation of journals. So our current initiative um, that falls within Plan S's concept of a diversity of business models is to approach the libraries with a subscribe to open concept, to ask them to renew their journals um, that want to convert to open access um, at a similar subscription level in terms of the finances, uh, and with the result that the journals are able to, if enough libraries sign on or renew, um, to move to open access. We've been doing this with a number of publishers, and I can just uh, give you a few examples. Berghahn Books is launching 13 journals on this basis uh, for 2020. Uh, Annual Reviews has five titles, and a group in Canada called uh, Coalition Publica has 50 titles um, that are moving to the subscribe to open model. This is all happening at this uh, point in terms of renewals, um, so we don't have the results yet from the libraries. Um, but we've had initial support from a number of libraries. We've had interest internationally in the model. Um, and we see it as part of this diversity of approaches, that there isn't yet a single solution um, in terms of moving to open access. But what we have at this point that's so exciting is we have the commitment of publishers, um, the large publishers like Wiley, the medium and small. Um, the scholarly societies are another area we've been working with um, around a similar concept that the subscription revenue is an important part of their operations um, and the subscribe to open seems to offer an opportunity for that. The funders role, let me conclude with the funders role, uh, Plan S has made a statement that in 2024 they'll be looking forward to uh, participating more directly with publishers, that is paying publishers directly rather than through grants to their researchers and through APCs. Um, and this idea that the Gates Foundation has uh, pioneered of paying publishers directly for open access to work that they sponsor, we think is very promising. We've done some research. Um, the degree of sponsorship for research articles is very high, of course, in the bio, biomedical field, 85, 90%. Science is percent and mathematics uh, the number of percentage or proportion of funders is around 60 percent but the social sciences and humanities which are an open question in these areas we found in anthropology for example that 25 percent of the articles had a sponsor um, and that even in the humanities or not even i shouldn't say that in the humanities it was eight percent um, not all of these funders would be willing to support directly the uh, publication costs by all means, but that combination of libraries and funders working together. And for us, Plan S signals that commitment from funders 
um, opens up the conversation and gives us a little bit of an impetus in terms of their willing to finance to develop these new models. I'll turn it over to uh, Stephanie, I think, at this point. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the SSP and Jason for inviting me here today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. In this discussion, I represent Wiley, so I'd like to provide you with a, just a bit of background to our company. Um, we're publicly traded and we have been supporting scholarly research for over 200 years. Um, we're headquartered in New Jersey, but we have more than 5,000 um, employees all around the world in uh, 70 different offices, 30 different countries. Um, our portfolio is very diverse. And besides journal publishing, we also publish about 200 reference works and more than 21,000 books online. And we support researchers at all stages of their careers. Our publishing, our journal publishing business um, spans more than 1,600 titles and they cover every discipline from humanities through to physical sciences. Um, 25,000 institutions access our journals um, through Wiley Online Library, and we're also a trusted publishing partner for about 600 scholarly societies. So we make publishing decisions in the service of supporting diverse constituents. We have researchers, institutions, scholarly societies, and funders, all of whom we're trying to work with and also to move our publishing process into a much more open um, way of doing business. Um, we have supported open access as it has evolved. Um, we converted almost all of our journals to hybrid in 2006, and that permits any researcher to opt to publish open access with a Creative Commons license in our titles that are otherwise subscription supported. In 2011, we launched the first of our gold open access titles, and we have a very robust portfolio now. I should point out that it's strong in life and health sciences. Um, that won't be any surprise, I think, um, although it's now expanding into physical sciences, um, and it's growing rapidly. Um, with interest in open access um, publications growing in Europe, we have secured a number of um, read and publish transitional agreements, beginning with the Netherlands, VSNU, in 2016. Since then, we've secured agreements with um, consortia in Austria, Hungary, and Norway. And in January, um, we secured our biggest agreement to date um, with Project Deal in Germany. Um, this was an important um, agreement insofar as we now have um, a, a, an agreement which permits uh, German researchers in over 700 institutions to publish open access in our portfolio with the cost underwritten by the institutions. It also provides read access to our entire portfolio going back to 1997. And we're really excited to see that Spring and Nature has um, followed suit last month. So we do see this as a very, very interesting um, way of bridging the gap between um, subscription and towards open access publishing. We're not the only publishers doing these deals. Um, ESAC tracks them and lists about 50 examples, which are largely but not exclusively in Europe. Um, I should point out at this right at the get-go, no transitional agreement is the same. Each one has been precisely tailored to the specific requirements of the consortia and the researchers they support. But all agreements support transition from subscription publishing to open access at rates that are sustainable for everyone concerned. Um, we're continuing to embrace move to more open publishing, but there is a spectrum of appetites and requirements for OA globally at the moment. And we're committed to making sure that transition is sustainable for all of our stakeholders and to doing this at scale. Um, and we're also investing in supporting open research, and I think we'll touch on this a little bit later, um, which is becoming the next wave after open access, I think, in publishing innovation. So I'm looking forward to discussing all of this with John and Harold here today, and I'll hand over to Harold. 
Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm Harold Varmus, and uh, I'm representing nobody except myself. I'm a biomedical scientist uh, with a range of experiences. Um, if there's any theme to what I have to say, it's this, that, that uh, relative to other sciences, it seemed to me that biomedicine has arrived relatively late to the Open Science Party and is moving more slowly than, than I would like, given my 20 years of experience in this domain. Now, up until about 1998, um, I was pretty addicted to the traditional model and uh, enjoyed publishing in the so-called high-impact journals. Um, and then as director of NIH, I was uh, schooled by a colleague and the developments that were occurring in physics with the development of the preprint server called Archive. And uh, I began to recognize the power of the internet to transform uh, the publishing of, of, of scientific information. Uh, and uh, as a result of appreciating that, I wrote a a uh, manifesto called eBiomed that proposed that NIH uh, help to host a an open archive that uh, preprints um, and uh, make the scientific literature to totally accessible to everybody uh, instantaneously. Uh, that led to the development of a much more conservative and perhaps more responsible uh, financially sustainable model that is currently in use everywhere throughout the biomedical enterprise called Biomed Central sorry, called uh, PubMed Central, an extension of tradi the traditional PubMed that includes full text of articles uh, that are published in, in the biomedical journals. Um, the difficulty of getting my colleagues and journals to uh, work with, with the PubMed Central led to the concept of open access publishing uh, through uh, the establishment of both of, a, of a, an organization that a couple of colleagues and I founded called Public Library of Science, or PLOS, uh, as well as uh, other uh, efforts uh, such as uh, Biomed Central. And um, uh, that is a model which I think everybody on this webinar is probably familiar with in which uh, payment for the process of publishing, publishing does cost money, uh, is dependent on having uh, payment by authors or by the funders of authors uh, to allow articles to appear on the internet as soon as they are uh, officially uh, accepted for publication. Um, since that time, nearly 20 years, uh, there has been slow and steady progress. Uh, the um, dream of having PubMed Central fulfill its manifest destiny of having essentially all articles supported uh, by the National Institutes of Health and other funders uh, in that collection uh, was achieved um, uh, mainly by Congress issuing a mandate in the late 2000s uh, to require that all uh, NIH-supported um, research appear uh, after a delay, so not true open access, in the, in the public digital library of PubMed Central uh, within a year after publication. Uh, furthermore, open access journals like the FLOSS journals and many, now many others have grown in number and size, so they now uh, publish uh, roughly um, uh, 25 to 30 percent of, uh, of uh, all literature. Now, why has the change been slower than many of us would have liked? Well, there are at least three factors that will play in our conversation. The first has to do with the essential conservatism of, of scientists about publication practices. Publication is the lifeblood of science. It's critical to uh, the development of careers of young and middle-aged and even old scientists. And uh, uh, all too many uh, reviews of scientific careers are based on publication in so-called uh, high-impact journals, that is, journals that have high journal impact factors. And it's been a slow transition out of that mode of evaluation, but an important one. And of course, uh, the conservation about publication practices is also predicated on the fact that uh, many of these journals do a very good job in presenting the work that they're publishing. The second reason is that uh, that commercial publishers are intent on protecting their financial interests, and adaptation uh, often occurs in a slow manner. I noted Stephanie's uh, pride in the hybrid journals that uh, her publish her, her employer publishes. Um, that's, in my view, double dipping, and that's got to be changed over the course of the next few years. Uh, the third issue is one that is painful to me because I'm a great uh, believer in, in soci scientific societies which are also publishers and uh, do a lot of good, uh, but in my view, they have failed to adapt to the 
new possibilities for sharing our information, uh, and uh, they have uh, failed to adapt their financial planning, uh, which is, of course, critical to their survival uh, in a way that would be good for science and good for their membership. So critical to the today's discussion is how are we going to speed things up? Now, you've heard an important proposal from John about, uh, about subscribing uh, to uh, open access and that I, by libraries and other institutions, that's an important development. Let me emphasize a few others. As you've heard, uh, many funders of research, especially in Europe, uh, have signed up for Plan S, which we will discuss in more detail. Uh, as uh, has been noted by Jason, um, and in full disclosure, I am a so-called ambassador for Plan S. I believe in it and advocate for it. Um, Plan S is dedicated to help publishers make the transition to open access so they can, so that scientists can conform with the very reasonable demand of funders, whether those funders are private or government. Uh, they have a responsibility to the people who provide the money and to the citizens and scientists who would like to use the information published by moving publication practices into a mode that's most uh, consonant with uh, rapid uh, with the rapid appearance of, of uh, the information. Uh, there is an important new development in the N at the NIH, uh, a first um, uh, sign that the NIH is paying attention to Plan S, which as I say, has largely been a European funders initiative uh, by um, requiring that scientists doing certain kinds of work at the NIH, work under the so-called Cancer Moonshot Program or work on opiate addiction, um, ensure that their work is published in an open access mode uh, at, at the time of, uh, of acceptance of their papers. Uh, we are seeing faculty and universities uh, make demands for open access and lower costs of publication. This has been exemplified most dramatically by the uh, combat between the University of California and Elsevier. Uh, in the U.S., there's a, and I think in Europe as well, there's an increasing interest in posting of of, uh, of unreviewed manuscripts as preprints, a practice that was adopted by physicists and astrophysicists and computer scientists uh, in 1991 through archive. And BioArchive is now rapidly increasing its, its uh, number of papers, and uh, that's a sign that, that our scientists are more poised to, uh, uh, than ever to get their work into a public, in the public space as quickly as possible. I think the advantages of open access have, are now more widely uh, uh, understood by, by scientists. Um, uh, one important factor that is a little below the radar is the changes that we're seeing um, in evaluation of scientists uh, making greater use of uh, a description of a few major contributions that a scientist has made to the scientific enterprise as opposed to emphasizing the number of papers published in, in, in so-called high impact journals. Um, there are other aspects of open science that I hope we'll talk about during this conversation that I think enhance uh, the receptivity of open access publishing and, uh, the, and uh, those include open peer review, which I think is an important topic to talk about, uh, greater emphasis on data sharing, uh, greater um, attention to methodology that's used for science to try to cope with what we call the, the reproducibility crisis in, in, uh, in American and European science, and perhaps a higher level of idealism among young people who understand that they're moving into a world in which uh, they may be judged by these uh, standard criteria of publishing in high-impact journals, but uh, they recognize the virtues of open access as well. There are also some new means of what we call publishing, that is posting papers on an open platform, allowing an open review, and then calling a paper reviews. And that's a, uh, an effort that's been pioneered by uh, Vitek Trotz at, uh, at the F Faculty of a Thousand Research. Uh, I'm an affiliate of that organization. For full disclosure, but it is a publishing model which has been adopted by a number of important organizations, including the Gates Foundation and others, uh, as that was mentioned earlier, uh, and that's, uh, I think, a development that we need to pay attention to. And then finally, I think scientific societies are beginning to see uh, new opportunities uh, in a world that is largely an open access world, an opportunity for 
playing a very important role in curation of manuscripts, uh, ranking of, of manuscripts with respect to their value, uh, employing the expertise of their members to make a coherent description of what's happening in work and annotating papers in a, in a, in a vigorous way. So um, I'm looking forward to uh, a chance to exchange views with my colleagues on the panel and to uh, hearing questions from the audience about these important matters. Thanks very much. Great, thank you very much, all three of you. Um, I, I would like to start out the, uh, the discussion portion of today's webinar with uh, a question that we've received from the audience. Uh, and this uh, question comes from uh, a, a former colleague and uh, old friend of mine who works at uh, one of the self-publishing societies in biomedicine. And he's Can asking- we how we were hearing from? Uh, sure, um, uh, David Sampson, the vice president and publisher at uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Uh, David asks, how can we collectively assess whether or not the move to open access is sustainable and not a more expensive cost shift that moves limited funds from actual research to publication charges and from lower subscription and licensing revenue to higher society member dues and meeting registration fees. I don't know if you're mute, John. Uh, John, your uh, lips are moving, we can't hear you. Yes, yes. Um, let me put some ideas behind that movement. Um, so our model, the, the subscribe to open, actually starts from that pr proposal or that proposition and the, um, it shouldn't be an increase in costs uh, to publish open access. They're, the only thing that's really changing is the, um, the basis on which the people can access the materials. The concept is that what publishing costs will continue um, and that the quality is actually an important aspect that could improve with open access and open data and open review and the things that Harold uh, mentioned. Um, and so the, the concept that we are somehow giving away the literature is not the case and the concept of a new revenue stream for increasing the cost should not be the case. Um, and the publish and read uh, model that uh, I was referring to earlier raises some of those questions, but I think there's a new level of transparency that's being introduced. So the, the prop, the premise is that we have enough money. We're spending enough, if not too much, but enough money on publishing um, and that we want to change, and it's a little deceptive to say this perhaps, but we want to change one thing, and that's the basis of access. Otherwise, we want to continue the quality improvements. We want to look at ways of creating greater interoperability um, around sources and resources, uh, and we want to allay the fears that this is somehow about the demise. I mean, Jason mentioned this in an earlier discussion as a society publisher, that this was a threat to the society. And I think we need to start from the premise that this, the current allocations for publishing um, are not in question. It's just the basis of access. Now, let me, I certainly agree with the things John said, and let me just point out that this is a, a, a difficult problem that every society has to examine carefully on its own terms. It may well be that in some cases, societies will have to raise their fees slightly, either meeting fees or membership fees. But my hope is they don't have to do that. And one way uh, to avoid it is to think about ways in which the kinds of uh, curation they might be doing on literature which is published in an open access mode uh, could be uh, a, on a, distributed on a subscription basis because it's not primary research, it's curation and, and valued and uh, uh, and carried out by the experts that uh, represent the society membership. If I may add, um, from our perspective, we talk a lot to our society clients about um, this. And um, I think we come from the premise that we serve the researchers first and we need to serve their needs. And if we do, researchers will come to us. So there's an aspect of um, providing the right tools and services is good business. Um, I'm saying this from a commercial point of view. Um, so we talk to societies about what exactly um, they're doing 
uh, like um, Dr. Varma says, to um, serve their community. And we're also talking to them about how their portfolios are organized, whether they're diverse, whether they're supporting their community and allowing um, researchers to publish maybe more of their research than they're doing right now. Um, there are many, many research artifacts that are not collected in a standard research article. We would like to be able to publish more of those. And um, we believe that's a better way to serve researchers and that they will use um, the society's journals in which to publish if they're attracted and able to do um, what they need to do now within those um, publications. And we see that growth is a way to um, shift the revenue streams so that um, societies can make their way through this transitional um, period. We don't know for sure what the models will look like in five years. We do know that the situation is changing. And from our perspective, um, we work with our partners to try to make this sustainable. But it does mean that you have to understand what your community needs. Now, um, we just talked about the moonshot um, and the need now, amongst, along with the opioid research, um, to publish in open access journals. Um, at Wiley, we've been working with researchers in oncology and we have options to publish um, open access there because we're working with the researchers to make sure that we can fulfill their needs. Um, so I would say that, um, there are many things that a commercial publisher can do to help societies, but you have to always be thinking about what you're doing to help researchers. And we're investing in new services so that beyond the research article, we can support other activities that researchers do and that just don't appear as research articles at the end of this. So I'm counseling diversification lots of diversification at this point um, and certainly openness and we're very very much behind the idea that more research um, should be accessible and discoverable um, than it is at present um, and we should all be work working in that direction. I'm curious about uh, people's response to this to the NIH's initiative to uh, require uh, open access publishing for people working under the cancer moonshot, a small subset of work being done by the National Cancer Institute and work on the opiate crisis. After all, uh, is there any biomedical scientist out there who thinks that their work is less important than what's being done on op opioid addiction and on uh, certain components of cancer research? I would think everybody would say the virtues of, of open access publishing that uh, are now being mandated for people in these two subsets of and I supported research should also want to have the ability to get their work into the hands of all colleagues and indeed into the hands of the public that's supporting and following this work closely as rapidly as possible as the internet now makes, pop, makes uh, possible. Harold, I would agree with you, but our experience mean, uh, tells us there's quite a lot of work to be done. Um, for example, although almost our entire portfolio offers the um, option to publish open access in our journals. I can tell you that there are still journals where no one opts for that. They all opt to be um, publishing for free um, in, a, in a subscription journal. Yeah, not, nothing is free. They're not publishing for free. They're publishing in journals that uh, require their institutions to pay yeah. what are often right. exorbitant costs for, for I, I access to, that. to material much later than and in a much more restricted fashion. All right, so I, I will concede that. That sounds sound like a good straight. thing, but then you think about it, you're just double dipping. You're getting payment and, for. But 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 my point is that um, researchers are not choosing to publish open access in those journals, and furthermore, where we have deals, well, because they can't afford we find to pay that a the, subset. The cost. We find that a subset of um, authors still don't choose the open access option. And Why not? I'm a little concerned that we need to do more work to educate the researchers on the benefits of open access. I think there's more work to be done there. We're certainly trying at our end, but I think that that's, it's not quite a done deal yet. Not everyone is convinced. And we still run into researchers who consider open access publishing predatory. And we win hearts and minds one at a time. 
but there so is let's distinguish still between system. between um, predatory journals, which do exist, and and uh, the notion that open access is a predatory mechanism. I, mean, I think there's a big difference. There are many high quality open access journals that do responsible reviewing and attract yes. great stuff. And then there are people that, for whom publishing becomes a, a vanity press, and that is predatory and uh, unfortunate, but it's, it's not inherent in open access publishing. I would agree with you, but we still find in our interactions with researchers that there are some places where that, that uh, view persists, and, and we work hard to try and change minds there. Well, I would like to hear from people who, who say they don't want to publish an open access mode, and I suspect that every one of them says, well, uh, I don't want to pay the extra several thousand dollars that uh, it costs to do that because funds are limited and they they feel that their work is perhaps not of uh, such great interest that uh, it needs to be delivered to everybody uh, at, at the time of publication. But uh, I think if they were offered the choice and uh, it was it was it, no it was not a, a, a tax a, a cost added on to uh, the subscription fee that they're already paying, uh, that uh, they'd be more than happy to have their journal be an open access journal as opposed to a journal that publishes some things with an additional fee. Well, with our new publish and read deal, this we, we will find out um, now that we're working with project deal because the um, model is different. It's not um, framed that way. So um, we hope that then everyone will opt for it. I'd be interested in the, the global implications. The publish and read uh, model is a country by country or consortia by consortia arrangement. Um, and so that it creates opportunities for those in the country with the deal in terms of publishing. Um, mm. They subscribe to open, not, to, I mean, I think there's a room for diversity of models. I don't want to yes. do a, a competition but one of the reasons we went with subscribe to open is that it opened the journal immediately for authors everywhere in the world for them to first see the journal which they probably haven't been able to do uh, and mm -hmm. then to publish in it without any restrictions um, and I think the global dimensions of this are an important consideration how does that work in publish and read well I think that right now um, subscribe to open is an interesting model um, but it is quite new and so we're watching carefully. It's still quite small. And remember, <laughs> we have to do things at scale um, and we want them to be sustainable. So we are a little more cautious about the models we adopt. But that is not to say that we wouldn't um, take on board different models, perhaps subscribe to open in the future. Um, we're eager to see you succeed with your model. John, just okay. if I can, Jason. back here. Yeah. Um, you know, we're talking about open access, but uh, Harold, you mentioned something you know, that, that uh, is important to us at, at the IRS in our our flagship journal, Anesthesia and Analgesia, back at uh, the end of uh, November, uh, I think it was November and December issues of 2018, uh, we pub or 2016, we published uh, two uh, collections of research on the opioid crisis and uh, with editorials and articles on the role that anesthesiologists have played and what they can do to, to mitigate it. Um, we're working with our commercial publishing partner, we published those articles free access as opposed to open access. So we weren't asking anything of our authors. We chose to just make that, uh, that content freely available from the time of publication. And, uh, you know, so, Free access, access, free access. Uh, well, there's a difference because an open access. I mean, you're not asking the author to pay because you, you're, it's still a subscription-based journal, and this is appearing in a subscription-based journal. And open access comes with a different licensing model, mm -hmm. and no. uh, you know that's so that's you're, a you're part the of the understanding. I, I don't that's know. Not, not necessarily the. Okay, you so that's holding the yeah, that your authors, um, uh, their work isn't available for others to reuse. Um, and so um, it, it's it's a different thing. And of course, free access um, is something that can be taken away. And we want the articles where we can sustain it to be out in the public record in perpetuity. Um, and 
with an option to be able to reuse at will. Um, that's the point of accelerating openness, I think, in science. And so that is um, one of the reasons why free access, from our perspective, is not ideal. It's better to go open access if you can. Thank you. It's not, it's not just about the payment. It's also about the, uh, the, the status of the, of the, of the work and uh, who holds the copyright and the perpetuity here. But, but better is, uh, is good. <laughs> good. Um, I've got a, is hard. I've got a question uh, from the audience. Uh, and this one is uh, possibly, I think, uh, directed primarily towards Stephanie. Uh, you counsel diversification. Have you any examples of uh, niche or small publishers? Well, I guess this is for, for John as well, undertaking something that is starting to prove successful. And of course, uh, you know, John, you've uh, you've mentioned uh, subscribe to open. Uh, are there any other models out there that uh, any of you are aware of that have been implemented at the small publisher or the self-publishing level that are seeing some success? The majority of journals uh, in open access still are published without an APC and are running on grants and allocations from their university, volunteer efforts. So there is a move, especially among groups of scholars who are more interested in the academic freedom or the expression of their work um, and supporting other colleagues in that area. So I wouldn't undermine that aspect. I don't think in terms of sustainability, it's some of these journals are 10 to 15 years old so they are sustainable. But in terms of scalability, in terms of Stephanie's earlier point, I don't think that's the way to go. Um, I think we are looking at about a $10 billion um, annual budget for scholarly publishing in terms of um, the typical figure released by STM. And uh, I think that figure needs to be redistributed in a way, but I also think that figure can sustain open access as it has sustained closed access. And so the idea that um, we need a new economy is not so much the issue as we need a new basis for sharing. But I would like to raise the issue of free riders. Uh, um, this has been about the longest I've ever had a conversation without on open access without it coming up. I appreciate that. Um, so let me uh, at least show a little foresight in, in introducing it. Um, the question is always about whether there, if we start to offer things on an open access basis, um, others will pull out and, and won't support it. Um, and I think we, that is a good question. I think it's a real question. The examples we have to date, to go back to physics again, Harold raised it as a, a leader in this field and they continue to be. Um, scope three example is 3000 libraries are essentially subscribing to open access. Um, for a dozen physics journals, particle physics journals. Um, and they're going into the second round of their uh, negotiations. So they've already been through a three year period and they're continuing. Um, and 3, 000, those 3000 libraries have seen almost no fall off. There are a few libraries that do not participate uh, out of principle and Stanford is one of those. Um, but 3000 libraries from 40 countries uh, have continued to support um, on, a, on a fee that's negotiated with the publishers. Uh, Elsevier is one of those, but also Society of Publishers, IOP is another one. So there are examples of how the support for open access is more than just an economic game playing. There's a sense of, of investment. I think Stephanie, you uh, reflect that, this very well. Uh, a sense of open access as being for the promote the progress of science to use the copyright phrase from the constitution. Okay, very good. Um, so I've got another question uh, from the audience. This is from Sarah Ruhi at uh, the Public Library of Science. Uh, she says, uh, those who don't want to publish in open access mode, and I think this is uh, in response to your comments earlier, Stephanie, mm -hmm. uh, are, are from different segments. For example, uh, corporate or industry and pharma in biomedicine. Uh, Sarah is proposing that the cost of reading will exit the system if read-heavy organizations like Pharma stop paying for subscriptions. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that kind of shift? Yeah, um, it, it's not just Pharma. There are um, 
parts of the, of the world where um, open access is, is not yet um, well accepted. There are reasons, uh, let me back up, there are reasons why authors um, don't want to publish in open access journals. Um, we've talked about them a little bit, sometimes a skepticism, sometimes a lack of ability to pay. There is also the issue of author choice, which we've been struggling with as well, and that is that um, right now, there are, is there still, I think, a dearth of very, very selective journals that offer open access options. Um, we're launching Gold Open Access titles with that specific mission, but researchers produce kind, different kinds of research at all different levels. And we haven't necessarily provided the right kinds of publications for them in the past. And um, open access model will work when we provide a home for researchers for every type of research that they do from the very groundbreaking to that which is confirmatory, which um, supports reproducibility, um, that talks about a new reagent and has that reagent identified correctly so other people can use it. Um, so I, I'm not answering your question very well, but there are lots of reasons why researchers don't choose OA right now. Um, and I think that practitioners are among them because um, of the funding issues there, um, but that we're working towards providing um, publications in so, which they can publish and um, that, if, 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 that model. If I can interject and then Harold, I see you, uh, yeah. you've got your, your hand up, but uh, so I think what, uh, what the question was really getting to wasn't um, the reasons the authors don't want to publish, but uh, you know, kind of touches on, um, you know, Harold, said publishing does cost money and uh you know yeah. john john has uh, mentioned that uh, you know as an industry we're we're spending enough but not too much on publishing so i think sarah's question was more to the point of part of the revenue that's currently coming into the ecosystem is uh, you know institutional subscriptions for access to large chunks of journals and uh, a lot of that uh, some of that money is coming uh, you know for aggregators like science direct and ovid uh, from mostly readers uh, like big pharma and industry. And if everything is open and they no longer need to subscribe to access and read this, uh, you know, that's a chunk of money that will go away. And so is the model then still, still sustainable if we're sort of cutting off a leg of the tripod? It will change. It will change if this, uh, as open access takes hold. I don't think there's any argument about that. Um, what we'll be looking for is to develop new streams of revenue based on open research where we can and services for researchers. But actually you've touched on a point that um, where um, people are paying to read but not to publish, um, there will be um, a, a diminishment in revenue from subscriptions. I just say a few comments about this discussion because uh, I think we're missing some major points here. First of all, the number of articles being published in open access journals has greatly increased over the last 15 or 20 years. The change has been slow, but there's certainly a much larger um, commitment to publishing in open access journals. The second thing is that the vast majority of the colleagues I know who don't publish in open access journals are not publishing there because they feel their careers depend upon publishing in journals that have remained uh, fairly fiercely uh, uh, addicted to subscription-based models or hybrid models, which are still basically subscription models. And uh, those journals, the one-name journals, Nature, Science, Cell, uh, have remained outside the open access camp. And the result is because of their um, high journal impact factor, the, the um, reluctance of many um, institutions to, uh, to abandon the traditional means of evaluating uh, job candidates uh, by the number of papers they publish in those most prestigious journals. Trainees and the sponsors of trainees are still aiming in general to publish in subscription-based journals, which have this um, 
uh, unfortunate uh, uh, prominence because of their of the journal's impact factor. Um, so I, I don't I, I don't meet people in my branch of, of of science who think open access is a bad idea. They simply say, uh, if I want my postdoc to get a job, a postdoc's got to publish in Nature. And uh, until uh, the funders come along and say, uh, we want our, the work that we support to be in an open format uh, and insist that the, the research that they pay for is published in that way, we're not going to win this fight. But I, but I think all of us should say that the principles of open access are you know, they're, they're financially sound. Uh, and it's not the, the, the decisions that are being made by my colleagues tend to be much more about uh, the perceptions of the value of publishing in certain places as opposed to the economic model that pays for the publication cost. Mm -hmm. uh, Can I jump in on the launch new question? journals that are, are um, hopefully as um, selective as those that you've mentioned? We have a new one coming out with Project Deal fairly shortly. We've launched, we're launching one in genetics and one in neuroscience. So we're beginning to look for ways in which we can create fully gold open access. Well, I think that's good. <laughs> Public Library of Science began that way. Just a second. You know, uh, and you know, we, um, Public Library of Science, which I'm a founder, uh, a co-founder, um, uh, had high aspirations and indeed publishes very selectively, very low acceptance rate for its flagship journals, PLOS Biology, PLOS Medicine, and some of the so-called specialty journals like PLOS Genetics. Um, and they're highly regarded, and people are not embarrassed by publishing there, and many of us publish there because we also believe in open access as a principle. But they have not displaced the journals at the highest level in this, in this so-called impact pyramid, and they have not uh, displaced the journals with respect to the aspirations of of young scientists who feel that they have to be in nature science themselves, they're going to be uh, successful in applying for jobs at Stanford, John, and Harvard, and other places. With respect, I, mean, just, thank I you, think Harry, that, just that for, may change okay. as we enable data sharing. There are some <laughs> subject areas which are much more collaborative than others. And being in an open journal and a, a, a high selectivity journal, which enables data sharing and collaboration, we believe is going to become very attractive and hopefully will make these journals competitive. Um, we're going for it. Okay, um, forgive me for going back to the question that's been raised. Um, and thank you, Harold, for the applause is establishing the quality that open access can achieve very quickly within two years. Biology was the highest ranked, PLOS Biology was the highest ranked journal. Um, the question of farm and responsibility your industry and responsibility, I think this is really just a technical question. I just wanted to speak to it very quickly. And that is that we're, we're able to monitor who is reading um, in a way that we weren't in the past. The subscriptions gave us a kind of sense of that. And the libraries have developed very strong standards around readership when a, there is a subscription. Um, but using IP address ranges, we're able to determine exactly how many downloads there are. Um, and much like the streaming questions with Taylor Swift and the music industry, we can look at the download situation in pharma and we can, as it were, go to these companies and say, you have a responsibility. This journal is clearly playing a key role in your operations. So the idea that money is going to go away or that we're going to lose somehow control of distributions, um, I think is something that we need to responsibly address. And that's been part of our research work to look at the proportion of funders, for example, and to look at ways to tracking IP addresses. I think the idea of the journal as a source of value for institutions from authorship and researchers and even rejected authors needs to be recognized. And that when we go open access, we're going to have a much greater participation in many journals than we've had in the past, that is in leadership um, and contributions, because they're open. And I think we do have a responsibility to look at that at this technical question in terms of tracking, but to see it as an opportunity for having much wider participation in the support of journals established by their value and their use. Thank you for letting me come back to the questioner. Thank you, John. Um, so 
I've got, uh, I, I want to move on to some of the other questions that we've had. Uh, we've got a, a question here from, uh, from another former colleague of mine, Cara Rivera. Uh, Cara is a, a longtime consultant, a former publisher and a longtime consultant in the, uh, the publishing industry. And uh, Cara expresses she's interested in seeing multiple models tried and appreciate uh, the more immediate OA that uh, the subscribe to open model produces. But uh, her concern is that libraries will not have enough of an incentive to continue to fund journals in this fashion in the future uh, as they continue to face new financial pressures. Uh, so uh, boiled down, her question is, what are the libraries getting for their money over the long term? And I think this one is, uh, John, uh, for you to lead yes. off. And I, I hope I've started to address that. That is the idea that libraries will get feedback on the value of the journal to them. They will see the user community and uh, much broader, the readership, is, but authorship reviewers, editors, board members. Um, so that part will be published. The libraries will also see that if they do not participate, then the journal will revert to subscriptions uh, and their community will lose out on that basis. So the idea is that it starts with the current commitment of the library. It's already subscribing to the journal. It's already finding value in that journal. And we're simply asking for it to continue that support. And we're willing to demonstrate that it is in fact a journal of value, of continuing value. There may be journals that fall off and there may be times when everyone, we had a recession in 2008 and revenues went down. Um, so this is not foolproof or bulletproof in that sense, um, but it is sensitive to the market. And I think the libraries are the one group that isn't simply looking for the best deal. They are looking at responsible coverage for their community. And we do have a responsibility to demonstrate that. Um, and we think it's fair to ask on that basis. So, so John, a again, it is a trial. Yep. Okay. A, a follow-up question on that, uh, that that somebody just proposed is, um, so what you're talking about is a model that is uh, transitioning or, or flipping traditionally uh, published journals. But what about with native OA journals, native OA publishers? Yes. Uh, they don't Very have good. subscriptions to flip, but, but can you transition them to this model? Do you think that's a, sustain, a sustainable way to take the burden off of the authors? Perhaps what do you see the it, advantages or uh, no, the, there are some challenges for existing ones. This is where we hope the funders will come in. That if 25% of the journal has, 25% of the journal's articles have a funder, we want those funders to pay directly for the work that is being published on their behalf. Um, so we want to go back to open access, to born open access journals, introduce them into this kind of model with the support of funders so that libraries are not carrying the whole of it. We want to use the similar kind of aspect of establishing the value of the libraries um, and we have economic aspects in terms of the open source software that we've been that i've been developing as an, another way of alleviating some of the costs so we have done some of the economic forecasting that i would be happy to share with people to show how existing open access journals would be able to transition um, with the support of funders uh, and with the support of libraries john i think that uh, it's fair to say that uh, even without library support, open access journals can succeed. Uh, funders are committed to open access. That's been demonstrated uh, in various ways. Uh, even when there was no Plan S, uh, those of us who published in open access journals felt we uh, could use um, money from our grants to, to, pay, to pay for publication. Uh, at Public Library of Science, not everybody could afford to pay. And when they didn't, that was no obstacle to publication but the payment rate uh, for virtually all journals was over 90% at Public Library of Science. The one exception may have been the, the, the FLOSS Journal for Neglected Tropical Diseases where the number was closer to 80 to 85%. Um, so I don't think we actually need, I, I welcome dramatically the, the, uh, the, the idea of the, the <laughs> library as a subscriber to, to open access journals, but. I'm not sure it's it's inherently necessary for the success of open access publication. The biomedical field's a little deceptive in that regard. When we look at the humanities with 8% funders. Yes. Oh, I, I admit it, I'm thinking about that. I agree with you about that. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Well, 
unfortunately, uh, we are at the end of our hour, uh, but I would very much like to express my sincere appreciation to John, Stephanie, and Harold for agreeing to be part of this, uh, this panel. Uh, you certainly uh, fulfilled what I had hoped for, uh, for this to be an engaging conversation. Uh, thank you all. And thank you, uh, thank attendees, you. for joining us today. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye -bye. And thank you once again to Jason, to John, Stephanie, and to Harold for a really invigorating discussion today. Thank you also to Sheridan, our sponsor, and to our audience for attending and for posting your questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of them. Once again, please do take time to respond to the webinar evaluation that you will receive an email. Your feedback will help us to continually improve the webinar program. Please also join us for our two upcoming SSP webinars. Our first free early career webinar, Falling into Scholarly Publishing Careers on September 26th. And then the next in our regular webinar series, Are There Finally Real Use Cases for AI on October 23rd. Thank you. And this concludes our webinar for today.